Hi everyone, I'm Bernie. Um, I thought I'd uh, make a quick video just to sort of explain um, uh, a bit about the 3D printed Titanic that I made, the big four meter long one or 13 feet, and just go through how I designed it, how I built it, uh, how it kind of performed, and where it is today. So the first thing I needed to do was get some lines drawings. Lines drawings are two-dimensional cutouts of a ship's profile that when you put them all together, you make a 3D image. Kind of looks a little bit like this. This example is the hull contours for the Great Eastern. I can't remember the exact lines drawings that I found for the Titanic, uh, but there are literally thousands of them out there. And because the original lines of the Titanic are still IP protected, all of the lines drawings that you've got out there today are fictional fan-made lines drawings. So making a Titanic model is all about picking the lines drawings that you like the most and trying to get it as accurate as you possibly can based on pictures. Once I got the lines drawings, I then had to start uh, tracing out the 2D uh, sections and then I put those 2D sections into SketchUp. After I finished establishing a 3D model of the 2D lines drawings, I then had the massive task of stitching them all together. There's probably easier ways to do it, there's probably better programs to use, but I didn't have very much money to spend on it and I had never 3D modelled before in my life. Everything that I've made, everything that I know is all self-taught. After I finished modeling the shape of the hull, I then had to put a little bit of texturing on the hull to sort of simulate the hull plating. It's not entirely accurate, but uh, if I was to individually model every single plate with the lack of skills that I had for 3D modeling at the time, um, it would have taken me 10 years or so. So I just did really basic um, extrusions on the hull that sort of simulated where every sort of row of uh, hull plating went. Then I had to design how all of the sections had to be cut up and how they were going to kind of fit into each other. Um, and because this was just the prototype, uh, this wasn't going to be my final model, I decided stuff it, might as well print it as I go. The printers that I had, I had two of them. They were self-built rep wraps and they had a build volume of uh, 300 cubic millimeters. So in order to fit this design uh, into the print uh, build volume, I had to split it down the middle and split it horizontally as well as splitting it every 300 millimeters uh, down its length. Sorry about the uh, shirtless picture here. If you haven't noticed yet, I uh, live in Australia and uh, it gets really bloody hot here. It wasn't until I had finished printing the first half of the model um, that I realized the scale of this project. I kind of knew it, but I didn't realize it until I had this much done. And uh, I realized I was probably going to have a few other problems down the track too. But I figured I'd just keep going and try and solve these issues as I, as I kept going. And at the end of the day, this was only the prototype. Uh, it wasn't my final product, so I thought, she'll be right, see how it goes. Next major section was the upper section of the hull half, uh, all the superstructure parts. Now, this part I specifically designed to be really thin and super light. Uh, just because I didn't know at the time what the buoyancy was going to be like of this thing. Um, I know from experience that uh, Titanic models tend to be a little too top end heavy out of the box. So to make one that kind of works properly, floats upright and has enough buoyancy um, tends to be a little bit hard. So I went super thin with all of the uh, superstructure parts. They were really hard to print. And if anyone else wants to build this prototype, it will be difficult to print. They're only about one millimeter thick uh, on all of the walls, but there is 
plenty of supports and structures on the insides to sort of compensate for this thin uh, shell. You'll note in this picture as well the lounge in the background. Um, it kind of gives you a really good sense of scale of uh, how big this thing is getting. Essentially, it's going to be the length of a full-size canoe. And yes, every single piece that you can see in this picture is 3D printed. Next came the upper decks and the funnels. And at this stage, it started to look like the Titanic. Uh, a lot of people mentioned that my funnels look a little bit too small. Um, just to sort of clarify, the scale of this model is 172nd. So I was able to uh, calculate based on actual dimensions of the real ship, uh, the uh, proper height of the funnels based on historical records. Now the reason why a lot of people think that they look a little bit small is because in a lot of uh, artistic representations of the Titanic, like for example the ones in the movie, the funnels were exaggerated because that's how people associate the Titanic as the Titanic with its four massive big funnels. So a lot of artistic sort of renditions of the Titanic exaggerate how big the funnels are. So I assure you, my funnels are spot on. Next came the stern section. Now, you probably noticed that I'm printing the ship into two separately floating sections. You're probably wondering why. Um, I had this big idea to sort of build a heap of ballast tanks inside it and to have the two sections joined at a hinge at the base with a little uh, locking mechanism um, so that the ship would remote control sink and split. But you'll notice a little bit further down the track the reasons why this idea ended up not happening. I also uh, had to start building a special cradle for the ship at this point as well. Um, I basically just had uh, two lengths of two before either side and then started 3D printing off uh, cradle brackets. So it uh, was a perfect socket for the model to sit in and it gave us the ability to sort of move it around and do what we needed for it. And here's the rudder that would be steering the ship. Um, one thing that sort of got me was this thing is huge. It's a massive big four meter long canoe essentially and it's going to be uh, controlled by this relatively small tiny little rudder sitting right at the back. Uh, you've got to remember as well only about two thirds of this rudder is actually submerged in the water. Um, it just sort of it, it, it got me how this huge big thing could be controlled just by this tiny little object in comparison. It's tiny. And next came the float testing. So having two different sections uh, independently floating actually came in handy because I didn't have a pool. So I managed to get a uh, blow up kiddie pool and it worked perfect to test it out. Uh, if anyone's wondering, my lawnmower was broken. Um, and I was really surprised at how well it actually floated. Um, it was very buoyant. Um, it had a lot of stability because of the shape of the hull, the square bottom. Um, and at this point, this is when I realized, oh crap, uh, I've got a problem. So that problem was that it was a little too buoyant. As you can see, the draft line there, the plimsoll, um, is well out of the water and it was going to need to have a hell of a lot of weight to get down to the plimsoll. So I tossed around with a whole heap of different ideas. Um, uh, using lead shot, I would need heaps of lead. Uh, and then uh, if it, I was to use the sinking function, that lead, the ballast inside it would start to move around. Um, and I thought maybe some dumbbells because I was going to need a hell of a lot of weight. I calculated out that I needed 140 kilos of weight uh, in the forward and aft section in total. And 
Um, I ended up landing on what was probably going to be the best option and the cheapest option at the time. At the end of the day, this was only a prototype, so it didn't really matter. I chose concrete. So yeah, this thing ended up turning into a giant four meter long floating brick. In total, the plastic weighed about 60 kilos. So with 140 kilos of ballast, the whole thing weighed about 200 kilos, which was pretty accurate weight for the, uh, uh, for the scale of the thing too. At this point, I was very thankful for uh, completely over-designing the cradle for it. I actually moved houses in between uh, building this thing too, and uh, yeah, it was a nightmare. Um, I didn't uh, think about how I was actually going to get it outside. So when I moved houses and I had to get it outside, I had to remove the front window to get it outside. <laughs> um, and I needed six guys to all work together to try and carry this bloody thing. That's when I realized the next problem that I had. I was probably going to need to mount this cradle onto a fully registered boat trailer. So after I moved house, I started uh, doing all the uh, finer details. So you can see all the bow details here. Um, started to come together quite well. Um, started looking fairly nice, considering that this was only really going to be my prototype. This wasn't the finished product or anything. Um, so I didn't really go to too much effort into, um, you know, the quality of painting that I did and, um, you know, sticking the models together properly. It was just sort of just all whacked in on there just to sort of, you know, give me an idea of uh, how the final one's going to work. So after a lot of searching, I ended up finding a really basic A-frame for a, uh, a boat trailer and I ended up mounting the existing cradle on the back of the boat trailer and um, worked quite well. Um, so basically launching this thing, I didn't need too much help. Uh, it was just a matter of launching this thing as you would launch a any normal boat on a boat ramp. And uh, I'll tell you what, if you want a way of getting people's attention on the road, um, try towing a uh, four meter long model of the Titanic behind you. Um, it certainly got a lot of uh, lot of gawkers um, on the way down there. People in the overtaking lane would just sit next to me for miles and take forever to overtake. It was actually getting a little bit annoying because, you know, when I needed to go overtake a truck or something, there'd always be three or four cars beside me, just not overtaking me. I also uh, got an awesome idea to make um, smoke generators for the forward three funnels as well. Um, because it was 3D printed plastic, uh, it heats up really easily. So I couldn't use the traditional uh, style of uh, smoke generators. So instead, what I ended up doing was I got uh, a whole heap of ultrasonic speakers and inside the funnels was a little computer fan and uh, a heap of uh, these ultrasonic speakers uh, submerged in a little bath of water. And you just pour water down the top of the funnels and um, make smoke. And it worked really well, as you can see here. But on the day, uh, as you'll see a little bit later, um, one of the generators, I don't know what happened, maybe it was just a short in the electric, uh, electrical wiring or something, um, just stopped working, so I only had two funnels going. But it, you know, looked good. So next I needed to select a place to launch it. Now the place needed to be very specific, had a lot of requirements. It needed a boat ramp, obviously. The boat ramp needed to be deep enough to fully submerge the trailer in because the, the, of the shape of the cradle, it couldn't just slide off the back. Um, and then it needed to be close to some sandbars um, that are completely out of the water when the tide is down. This was just in case I had missed something and it started to leak. Now, as you could probably be aware that uh, 3D printed plastic is really hard to seal. And the bigger the model, the harder it is to seal it, the more chances that you're going to get a leak somewhere. Um, in the model, I actually had uh, a, somewhat of a fail-safe system. Uh, several sections of the hull were um, uh, had a little uh, water pump attached to a little float valve. Um, so the little float 
uh, float switch would go off if it ever filled up with water and it would turn the water pump on and start pumping it out. Um, thankfully, I didn't end up having to use this, uh, but I found the perfect spot. Uh, the f- perfect spot was at a place called Minamara uh, on the south coast of New South Wales. Um, not only was it the perfect spot and it uh, met all the requirements that I needed, um, but it served as a pretty nice background too. Everything was really green with the nice big rolling hills um, in the background and some of the islands there. So we had the spot and now it was time to launch it. Um, firstly, uh, just a disclaimer, I didn't really set up anything to film the first launch of the prototype because I really wanted to actually do a proper film of the um, final product. Um, I just didn't know how the prototype was going to work, uh, whether it would work at all. Um, I thought that I was going to have some massive issues with the fact that it uh, it was a giant 200 kilo floating brick. Um, and I had, to be honest, I didn't want to film my failure. Um, and it didn't fail, it worked. Uh, you can see here in this uh, uh, really dodgy video, yes, all the video footage is really dodgy because it was just uh, what one of my friends had filmed on the fly. Um, and I wasn't set up to film this properly. Um, so you can see down there, I was uh, testing just the hull with none of the superstructure or anything on it because the superstructure just all lifts off. And um, it worked well. Uh, down there was myself uh, in the controller with the white shirt and uh, the bloke next to me is uh, my old uh, shipmate from my Navy days, uh, Drew. So this video is getting pretty long now. Um, so I figure I might as well wrap it up there. Um, in the next video, I'm going to go through how the, um, the model performed um, on the day when I actually sailed it around. Um, a couple of little uh, surprises that I found with that um, and where the model actually ended up uh, going to in the end and where it is now. Um, also, I want to go through um, what I am currently up to with the model because remember this was only the prototype. So what is the product type? and uh, where it is at the moment. Thanks everyone. If you want to get an update on uh, the new video that's going to come out, uh, click subscribe and um, hit that little bell notification thing. Um, And uh, let me know what you think in the comments um, and what kinds of uh, videos you want to see more of, if you want to see more of the Titanic or if you want to see some more of my other models. Thanks everyone and uh, hopefully see you soon.